You're listening to the Valley Labor Report with David Story and Jacob Morrison. The time has come for America to hear the truth. We are going to stand with them, and not only are we going to fight for their rights, but we're going to stand up for our rights here in our state, in our homes, and in our community. One day longer, one day stronger. One day longer, one day stronger. Because the future of labor's rights in the United States of America is not going to be decided in the courts. It's not going to be decided in Congress. It's not going to be decided on talk radio. And it sure is not going to be decided on Fox News. For the union makes us strong. Solidarity forever. Good morning and welcome back to the Valley Labor Report. My name is Jacob Morrison here with my co-host David Story. David and I both believe very strongly that unions are good for workers. We've come to believe this through years of research, experience, and practice. The goal of the show is to communicate this truth with a wider audience. And in pursuit of that goal, it's sometimes necessary to back up and talk about fundamentals. I know what it's like to grow up in rural Alabama and not even know what a union is. I don't believe that I have any family that's a member of a union. I don't there's not a history in my heritage of unions. And if you had asked me when I graduated high school what a union was, what they do I would have I, I wouldn't have really had an answer for you. Um and I, most people in Alabama don't. Most right. people in Alabama have no clue what a union is or what they do. That that's exactly right. I you know, I I could have talked a little bit about what I learned in my history books, but it, you know, just by and large I really didn't know. And so a lot of folks are in that situation. They don't even know what a union is, much less how it functions or how it can be helpful to them at their workplace. And so we've been talking for some time before we got on the air, actually, um, about this, about kind of the fundamentals. Uh, and we've created a couple of YouTube videos about what a union is. Uh, you can um, look up our YouTube channel, The Valley Labor Report on YouTube, and you can find those. Uh, we talked about what it is structurally, what a union is. We talked about day-to-day uh, -day operations of a union. We talked about some labor history. And like I said, if you want to go check up, uh, check those out, they're still on YouTube. And I think there's some really good information in there. But today, we wanted to talk about the real material benefits that unions bring to their members, to their community, and even, believe it or not, their companies, although that, in my opinion, is secondary. Um, and then we're going to explain why that is. So, Firstly, you know, th and this one is the most obvious. It's the one that, that gets bandied about the most when, when you talk to union advocates. It, there's a wage premium that unions bring to workers. Uh, among full-time salary and wage earners, union workers make about 23% more than their non-union counterparts. That's from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And that that's, you know, 23%, that's a lot of money. Now, of course, as with anything, there's there's going to be differing views on this. There's going to be arguments to be had. And one of the anti-union wage premium arguments is that this aggregate data is not rigorous enough. There are likely confounding variables distorting the data that, uh, you know, say unions are concentrated in areas with higher cost of living. And so, of course, the union wages are going to be higher because there are more union members, say, in New York or California. California, where the cost of living is is much more than say in Alabama, and so if you compare those wages, it doesn't really make sense. And and you know that that's a good argument, right? It doesn't make sense to compare what a union person makes in New York to a non-union person makes in Alabama. And so there have been plenty of studies that take into account those variables. They take into account education, experience, geography, which I think is one of the most important things, and. In all of these studies, in almost every industry, you still get a union wage premium, just a little bit smaller one, something like 10 to 20%. And, you know, the fact that, like, anti-union advocates 
throw this around and say, oh, it's just a smaller wage premium. Like a 10% raise? 10% is pretty good. 10% yeah. is darn good. I don't know. There, you know, How many times in your career do you get a 10% raise? Well, and you got to couple that with the fact that, uh, you know, most most non-union workers and most non-union companies don't want to uh, to address it, but the fact is, union wages, even in the area, increase the wages of everybody around because in the market, then all of a sudden the the companies are competing for that same labor group, so they're going to have to wait raise their wages to uh, to compete. And one of the things that that uh, you know it, it, coincidentally. When we were in negotiations with uh, with my union, not this past contract, but the contract before, even the chief negotiator there said that in in the uh, in the business community that the other CEOs and and plant managers in the area had came to her and said, "Your employees are making way too much money. We're having a difficult time competing with those with that same labor group," and so. Uh, he, she brought that to the table and said, "Look, y'all, y'all are asking for too much, but the fact of the matter is, we're we're worth it." And that's 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 one of the things that everybody has to get in their mindset is, if you're making money for the company, then you are worth what you're making. That's exactly right, and that's another thing. Unions increase non-union wages. And that makes intuitive sense. Obviously, like David was talking about, if unions increase wages for their members, and they do. Then they create employer side competition. And this is something that anti union folks love as long as it's the workers that are competing to bring home enough money to live on. But they don't like it so much when it's the employer having to compete by raising wages. The non union workers most benefited by strong union presence are men with no more than a high school degree. For those workers, the decline in union density since 1979 has meant a $3,200 decrease in annual wages. You know, lots of folks talk about wage stagnation since the 70s and the 80s. And that is, like I was talking about before, that's aggregate data. When you actually look at different groups of folks, when you look at non-union men, men that have no more than a high school degree, their wages have gone down. They would have gone up if we had kept the union density that we had. And how can we know this? We know that because even when the union, uh, even when the labor movement was at its strongest, there have always been pockets of the U.S. or certain industries that uh, have been resistant to unionization efforts. And we can compare real non-union wages in union-dense areas to real non-union wages in areas with sparse representation and see uh, uh, what changes are made when there's a really strong union density in the non-union labor market. And that's something that, you know, uh, uh, that that's something that's not talked about enough is that unions are good for all workers. We increase the wages, we increase the working conditions, we uh, we make better the working conditions, we make better the benefits for everybody in the same labor market as us. Yeah, yeah. Healthcare. Ninety five percent of civilian union workers have. Uh, employer-sponsored health care. 68% of non-union workers have access to employer-sponsored health care. Yeah. That was in 2019. Not just employer-sponsored health care, too, I'd like to point out, but better exactly. employer-sponsored health care. You know, whenever I talk to people out on the streets and tell them about my health care and the fact that all I all I do whenever I go to the doctor is make a copay, or when when uh, we have to go to the hospital, my wife had uh, some issues a few months ago, and I paid 150 bucks, and that was it. There's no deductibles in my mm -hmm. in my health insurance. So you know, while everybody else is out there trying to figure out can I get these surgeries in by the end of the year, we don't have to worry about that. Right. It's 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 a hundred percent better for every different health care benefit. Uh, whether you talk about short term disability, whether you talk about this or that, union workers have it. More often, they pay less and they get more services in return. Retirement. 90% of union workers have retirement plans with their employers compared to 77% of non-union workers. Safety is a very important Safety's one. Safety is very important, yep. Unionization is associated with a 13 to 30% drop in traumatic injuries and a 28 to 
83% drop in fatalities. Unions are the embodiment of solidarity, cooperation, and brotherhood of working people, and they care more about their safety than businesses do. Laws and regulations are reactive. Unions are proactive. This is the Valley Labor Report. We'll talk more after the break. News Talk 770 AM, 925 FM, WVNN. Just like the father of my father, Tom stole his mind, and I can't forget that one fourth of his blood is mine. I try not to worry. Welcome back to the Valley Labor Report. My name is Jacob Morrison here with my co-host David Story. We were talking about the benefits of unionization um, that that unions bring to workers, that unions bring to their communities. And when we left off, we were talking about safety. We talked about how there's nearly a 30% drop in traumatic injuries that are associated with union workers and a, tw- a 30 to 80% drop in fatalities at union workplaces. Let's and, let's talk about that for a second yeah. because you know a lot of times you, you we bring up these numbers and like uh hourly wage increases and how they're better than non-union areas and everybody knows why because we go in and negotiate collectively as a group so we get more as a group than somebody going in and trying to ask for a raise on their own but a lot of people don't understand the reasoning behind why the safety aspect is more uh important and the workplace is safer in a union area and that's because in a union, generally you set up in your contract with a company, a safety committee that is made up of the workers. And we have a group of three workers at, at our plant. They're members of the safety committee and they sit down with the company every month to meet and, and go over what were the accidents that happened this past month? How can we, uh, how can we fix these? How can we alleviate these, whether it be uh, through, you know, maybe it was a employee that made a mistake or maybe the equipment was failing, but they're out on the floor every day talking to people and trying to figure out how we can make the workplace a safer environment for everybody. And that's why you see that greater increase in safety awareness and safe workplaces and unions as opposed to non-union places. Right. And, you know, like technocratic liberal types, they may think, you know, there, there are some some like liberal types that are like, oh, well, we don't need unions anymore. We've evolved past the need for unions or, or whatever. And they think that maybe laws and regulations can substitute for that. But there they there is no substitute because the laws and regulations or whatever that government tries to do, there's just simply like the government is not going to have the budget to put, like you said, three workers at every single workplace to oversee the safety and and you know and, and even if they did those workers are not you know they don't have the same relationship to the employer and to the coworkers there that a union safety committee does yeah. and 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 the studies bear this out like laws and regulations they just simply don't work yeah, as for, well for as every, unions all do. the conservatives that, that that are out there that want to talk about free market and reduce you know an overbearing government or the regulations that mm-hmm. government put in place well this is your alternative to that free more right. to you know in the free market is let's get rid of some of this government oversight and let's let the workers handle it because who right. knows better how to make their workplace safe than the workers right you know um legislation and rate regulation is reactive like that comes in most often you know sometimes there's some proactive legislation or regulation but it's not it's not common usually what happens is they set up a penalty if something bad happens what unions do what what those safety committees do they are proactive they constantly patrol the work site and make sure that workers are safe and and talk to the workers about what they need it's not it's not reactive it's proactive and that's the difference yep and we you know one one thing that we do in our places and i'm sure y'all do it out there as well is the fact that you know if if a worker feels unsafe on the job they they ring up one of the stewards and bring the steward over and say hey i i i don't think this is right you know maybe uh 
Maybe maybe the equipment's faulty. You never right. do know. But, uh, you know, they say, hey, I'm not too sure about this. And we've got it in our contract where it says, look, if a worker feels safe, we're going to stop right then. We're going to call folks over and let's get this handled. And, and we don't go back to work until everybody feels safe. Right. And, and one of the reasons, one of the reasons that, you know, not even just that there's a safety committee, but like. When you have a union contract, you can't be fired unless you have, uh, or, or there are there are provisions in there that that say that you know after a certain time you have a probationary period in a lot of in a lot of contracts. But they say that uh, you can't be fired unless you have just cause. So in union workplaces, workers have much more freedom and they feel that freedom to say something like you were talking about, like, Hey, you know, talk to my steward. I don't really feel comfortable with this. Can you check this out for me? Or where in a non-union workplace, they may be afraid and rightfully so that if they say something, they'll be fired or they'll be retaliated against, or they'll have their pay docked for yeah. uh, noting a safety concern. And that's, that's common. That's common. And they you know, they have reason to be afraid where in a union workplace, uh, they are much more free and they can, you know, workers can tackle problems that, that managers, that supervisors, that CEOs and bosses, they just don't see because they're not on the floor doing the job. Yeah. And one of the things that, you know, to take into consideration is we talk about these contracts a lot and these contracts, you know, it, it probably bears to clarify that these contracts, a lot of times when you talk, uh, to people that's never been in a union, they think all oh, the international or the union, the big union bosses is going to come in and tell you what to do. Look, these contracts are negotiated with the people in your plant. I'm on the right. negotiating committee in our plant. We sat down with the company and negotiate these uh, months in advance. And it's voted on by the people in your plan. It's a very democratic uh, way of handling things. You right. know, if we don't get uh, 50%, then, you know, we go back to the table and try to try to work on something different. But the, the point is there's no big union bosses that's coming in to tell you what to do. Whenever you're in a union, the union is all the workers right. and those contracts take that gray area, that, uh, that unknown out of what your daily work is, you know, what your work schedule is, you know, what your shift is, you know, it's not going to change the, the, the manager ain't going to be able to come in and tell you tomorrow, Hey, you got to go to third shift. I don't care what your, what your family situation is. Mm -hmm. If you don't go, you're terminated. Right. Those contracts take away mm -hmm. all those unknowns and clarify everything for everybody. Right. Now, I, I think that if I remember correctly, you've never had a non-union job, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, David, like, probably can't even imagine this, but like, I've worked in a lot of non-union workplaces and, you know, talking, if I were to go back there or, or back in time and say, you know, uh, Jake, in, in, in your future contract, in your future employment contracts, you're going to be able to like help write them or something or, or tell my coworkers or tell people that I used to work with, tell them today that like, if you organize and you, uh, get your coworkers together in your workplace, you can write the contract that you're employed under. You can help write that with your boss. Like that's just not something that people who don't work in a union workplace, that's just not something that that they're familiar with. And that's not something that that well, it just doesn't happen. Yeah. Who wants to go who wants to go year to year wondering if you're gonna get a raise? Right. You know, that's one, you know, one of the big benefits is hey, we got a four year contract. We know we're gonna get three percent, three percent, three percent every year. Or you know, who like if you're talking about service workers, those folks they go week to week not knowing when they're gonna work. Yeah. Or most, not knowing how much they're gonna work. Yeah. I remember working at a restaurant one week just because uh just because the boss on a whim decided to hire three more servers, I went from working 60 hours a week to working 25 hours a week. I yeah. didn't have any say over that. I didn't, there wasn't anything I could do. The boss hired three more servers uh, to punish somebody for like not coming in on time. And so all of us got our hours cut in half. And like, you know, I was at home, I was living at home, right? I didn't have bills or, or I didn't have like rent to pay or anything. So it wasn't that big a deal for me at the time. But there were people that I worked with that had children, they had rent, they had gas to pay, they had car insurance, they had to put food in their children's mouths. Yeah. And, you know, they just, and their hours were just cut in half. Yeah, it's, yeah. And at the whim of the boss. Yep. 
it's it, it's sickening really and that's yeah. what, that's one of the things that's one of the great things about being a union member is you it it takes away all that gray area you know exactly what your roles and responsibilities are and you know exactly what the company's roles and responsibilities are right and you know like the you talked about this a little bit you know but the the reason that that's able to happen is you know, like unions, they bring better wages, they bring better retirement packages, they bring better health care, they increase non-union wages. And like, so the question is, why does that happen? Are unions magic? And no, unions aren't magic. The, the, the reason is that the collective bargaining process, whether it's formal or informal, it brings more leverage to everybody. Because no matter how talented you are as an individual, you are not worth the whole workforce. The whole workforce, the, you know, the sum is greater than the uh you know the whole is greater than the sum of its parts right, right. Uh, 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 so when you all bargain together collectively you bring all your skills all your talents all your experience everything to the table uh and you get more for it you know yeah. like that's that's the simple fact no matter how you calculate it um uh it, you're just not worth the whole workforce and you cannot bring the leverage of the whole workforce into individual contract negotiations. Like it just doesn't work that way. Uh, that's the reason that collective bargaining is so important. So uh, we're going to take another break. If you'd like to weigh in on the other side, call one 866 494 wvnn Again, that's one 494 9866 This is the Valley Labor Report. Thanks for listening, folks. If you want to keep up with us throughout the week, you can follow us online. We've got a Facebook page, facebook.com slash Valley Labor Report. You can search us on YouTube at The Valley Labor Report. We're on Twitter at Labor Reporters. I'm on Twitter at Jacob M underscore AL. David is on Twitter at Radical Unionist, R-A-D-I-C-L Unionist. If you appreciate our work and want to ensure that we can stay on the air, consider supporting us with a monthly donation on Patreon at patreon.com slash the Valley Labor Report. 